So I actually had the pleasure of working with Trevor on uh, something called the Commission on, on Growth and Development. And as part of that exercise, listening to him and other leaders around the world, and especially leaders from Asia, I substantially changed my view about the key to economic development and success in development. And you can capture this in a diagram uh, that I've put up here. This is the standard representation that economists use of the market for labor. There's a downward sloping demand curve for, for labor. The lower the wage is, the more workers will, will be employed. And the, the deep insight that uh, many Asian uh, countries uh, had, and the, I think really the distinguishing characteristic of Asian development was a commitment to make sure that everybody had a job. Do whatever they had to do to clear the labor market so that everyone had a job. Now, the reason they did this, I, I learned, was the same reason why we make schooling not just an option, but we make it obligatory. We make schooling obligatory because when people go to school, they learn valuable skills for their own benefit. They will have higher wages throughout the rest of their life. But they also learn skills that make them better citizens, contribute to the success of the society as a whole. And what the Asians understood, but, and as, as economists we know, but somehow as policymakers we just seem to forget, is that that process of acquiring skill continues right through from your time in high school into your time in, in your first job. And if the school system is not as effective as one would like in conveying very basic, very critical skills, the first job may be even more effective at transferring both socially valuable and personally valuable skills than, uh, than high school. So that there's an enormous waste associated with depriving people of, of the chance to work. And if you think about it, having to set a low enough wage to clear the labor market shouldn't necessarily be an issue because we force high school students to go to high school for a zero wage and why, why should we then insist that there's a minimum wage that might be so high that once they graduate they can't get the chance to learn from uh, work on the job, especially on the job in a formal sector firm. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you a story about the, the charter city activity that I do. I, I am now talking to governments all over the world, trying to find governments that would be willing to set up these very large scale uh, reform zones. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna focus tonight on South Africa, and this is not a, an option for South Africa, but there was another time when I was in another country in Africa, and I woke up uh, on the morning in Africa, the, uh, on the evening here in the United States when uh, the election was held uh, for, uh, for Obama. So I got up in the morning, turned on the TV, watched Obama's uh, acceptance speech, then watched uh, John McCain's uh, concession speech, and then went to meet, had a whole series of meetings all day, all day long at, uh, in the government there. And every single government official I spoke to had seen both of those speeches, and every one of them wanted to talk to me about John McCain's speech. Uh, you know, so, okay, Obama won, you know, big deal, but they were all astonished by this phenomenon of this graceful, courageous, dignified concession by somebody who had, who had just lost an election. I've never been as proud to be an American as I was that day, but it also is a kind of a caution that it, the, the whole world really is watching when we do things here in the, in the United States. And we have to be cognizant of that uh, because we can do things that can be beneficial, but we can also do things that are, that are harmful. So in the economics profession, we, we've been fairly tolerant of the idea that the goal in policy should be to have decent jobs. This is the language pushed by the International Labor Organization. Every job should be a decent job. No person should work in a job which is not decent. And the ILO and economists who talk about this frame their, their language carefully, but around the world, what people hear is that everybody should have a job which pays a relatively high wage. And we've also, as economists, found a lot of ways to rationalize the, the minimum wage uh, in the United States. Uh, 
if, if, if you think of the minimum wage as being like when they put leeches on people in medicine, you know, what we say as economists now is, well, you know, if it's the right kind of leech and if you don't put too many on, it's really okay to have, and it's, it's a good thing to have some leeches. You know, we understand. People really like leeches, and so we're, we'll, we're okay. We're okay with leeches. But the translation to a, a place like uh, South Africa is a push for decent jobs with very high uh, minimum wages and very high levels of unemployment as a, as a result. And I want to try and argue that this is the opposite uh, of the experience in, in, in Asian development. It's, it's a very corrosive force uh, in the economy there. This is one manifestation of this. You're, you're used to hearing about things like Gini ratios as measures of inequality. But I suggest that the right thing to think about is inclusion. And a key metric on inclusion is do you have a stake in the market, uh, the market economy? One simple way to measure that is to look at the ratio of employment to the, to the population. And this gives you uh, that ratio for Brazil, China, India, South Africa, and the OECD countries. So this is the ratio of uh, employment to the working age population. And what's striking about South Africa is the very low uh, employment to population ratio. The majority of adults in South Africa do not get the benefit, uh, participate in. They're not included in the market economy. So even though it's democratic uh, in, in a very full and vibrant sense, it's very, uh, it's the opposite of, of inclusive. And other countries, Brazil, China, do, do much, much better at, at, at this. Uh, one of the things that uh, is common that I heard when I talked to people in South Africa was a combination of they'd heard, in effect, that, that the minimum wage was right, that you really should only be pushing for, for decent jobs. And if you have high levels of unemployment, well, then that's a problem for the government to solve through some kind of a stimulus program. So what you heard is, yes, we have very high levels of unemployment, but if we could just get growth in the economy, we'll, we'll, solve, that, uh, we'll solve that unemployment problem. This tracks the uh, employment to population ratio uh, from 2000 through 2009. And you can see that there was a little bit of an uptick from 2004, 2005, 2006, uh, 2007, and then it's some downturn with the, with the crisis. But, you know, the striking fact is not the cyclical fluctuations, but just how far below they are, the, these comparison countries, um, where uh, BIC here means uh, Brazil, India, Indonesia, and China. And these are all data that I've taken from the, the OECD and that I, I used when I, when I talked to people in, uh, in, in South Africa. Now, you don't need to read anything on this chart, but just understand that the, the length of the bar tells you about the success of the educational system as measured by student test performance and longer bars are better. The, uh, the right is math, uh, the left is, is reading. And South Africa uh, stands out uh, particularly for the very low fraction of its graduates from its schools who perform at basic competence levels in, uh, in reading and math. So you have a population who are very badly served by their educational system, and this is, this is widely acknowledged. There are, of course, some very good schools in, in South Africa, but there are some very bad schools, and uh, the evidence is, is they probably deteriorated since uh, uh, in, in the, last, uh, the last decade or so. So you have a school system which is not giving young people the, the, skills, uh, the skills that they need, and um, a, a kind of an economic policy which then deprives them of the chance to learn some of those skills when they, uh, when they, when they graduate. Uh, I, had a, I had a conversation with another recipient of the Rechtenwald Prize, as it will turn out. Um, I, won't, I won't name this person, but a kind of a more, little bit more left of center uh, economist who uh, was commenting about another country where I was advocating the importance of a, of a first job, a first job in manufacturing. And he said, well, you know, those, those jobs, it's, it's it's just like sweatshop jobs. They're just, you know, they're just on an assembly line. They don't, they don't learn any valuable skills uh, uh, in, that, in that kind of a job. And if, you're, if your measure of skill is, uh, you know, can you program the computer or uh, something, use a spreadsheet, that, that's true. But, but if you actually look at the data on what happens to the lifetime earning capacity of somebody who gets a job in something like manufacturing, it's really quite astonishing. There's some very interesting data on Mexicans who've come to the United States, who get a job in 
low-wage manufacturing. So these are not particularly skilled Mexicans. They get a job for low-wage manufacturing, then they go back, and if they work in the same area in manufacturing in the United States, I mean, in Mexico, when they go back, they have a permanent 10% increase uh, in their wages based on one year of employment in, in the United States. If they don't go back to exactly the same kind of job, it may be more like a 5% increase over time. But that's a bigger increase in wages than they'd get from an additional year of, of, of schooling. So the, the skills learned on the job in a formal sector firm can be extraordinarily important. And if you really think about the, the, the things that are taught there, things like punctuality, respect for your coworkers, cooperation, deference to others when there's a disagreement and you might not, you might not win the disagreement, uh, attention to detail. These, these are extremely important uh, skills. And when I say school is work, school should be work in the sense that we learn those, those kinds of things uh, in school. But when I say uh, work is school, if we don't learn them in school, we have a chance to, to learn them on, on the job if people can get jobs. So the usual complaint economists offer about the minimum wage is illustrated in this, in this diagram. If you drive the wave, wage up uh, the way I've suggested with the green arrow, then employment will go down. You'll have people who are deprived of both the chance to earn income and to produce. But most critically, they're deprived of the chance to learn those skills that they often didn't get in, uh, in, in, uh, in school. Um, that it's, it's possible that you can make an argument for why minimum wages might not have been too troubling or too harmful in part of the, the South African economy. So if you think about the mining sector, for example, and you think of E1 as the total number of workers who would be employed if the wage had been at a low level that would actually clear the, the labor market in this economy. What I think has happened in South Africa was a deal where the workers in the mines demanded through their unions wages that were above the wages they would have earned absent the union, but also demanded that the mine keep hiring the same number of workers as they would have hired before. So there's no inefficiency in terms of uh, unemployment created here. And because the mines have very significant profits based on ownership of the, of the resources, they can afford to pay an above, an above market wage. Then in effect, what this is is a kind of a transfer of what would otherwise be a share of the profits for the owners to the miners who work in the mining firms. And if you think about inequality, it's a kind of transfer which would go from uh, the traditionally white, wealthy, or foreign owners of mines to the workers. And so you can see the, in some sense, the appeal of that. But then when that wage becomes the wage which applies across the entire economy, you then have the manufacturing exports the garment assembly uh, jobs, which are not viable. They can't, they can't afford to pay these kinds of wages. And there's no extra profits that you can extract out of somebody in the garment assembly business. So what South Africa has is very high wages. Some um, who, people who are employed in, uh, in places like mining, where they have, uh, um, they're, they're well employed and these are good jobs. But very little of the kind of garment assembly, light manufacturing that we see all around the world, which is often where a person gets their first wage paying job in a, in a formal sector firm. Now, if, if you get stuck in that equilibrium and you experiment as a policymaker, cutting wages seems like it has no effect. So you know, when I talk to people, they'll, in the jargon, the economists all know, they, they talk about the elasticity of demand. You try driving the wages down. In the story I was telling about mining, it, it doesn't actually lead to any more employment. So you discover, well, that's a, that's a dead end as a, as a policy. But of course, if you keep going with it to the point where the wages clear the worldwide wage in, in garment assembly, and by the way, I should explain to the non-economists, why is the demand for labor in garment assembly a, a vertical line? It, it's basically any nation in the world can get as many jobs as they want if they're willing to have their workers work at the worldwide competitive wage in garment assembly. It's this incredibly mobile industry, just will go anywhere around the world if they can hire workers at comparable wages. 